Hello, everyone. It's Wednesday night, and that means it's time for the Writer's Room. I'm your co-host, Kat Rocha, the night editor, and with me, as always, is... Jay Ishirofini, author and alien in a human suit. And tonight's very special guest is Skylar Hernstrom. Yeah, he has been a paratrooper, a sailor, a janitor, a bouncer in Thailand's Rapongi district, and a librarian. But we'll, <laughs> we, we like this one best. Yes. We're going to want to know about the Rapongi district. That sounds yes. uh, very interesting. Yeah, that was in Tokyo. Um, mm -hmm. And Rapongi is a district in Tokyo that's ah. famous for like uh, nightclubs and bars. Their hostess clubs. And uh, where uh, foreigners go to party. And um, it was a lot of fun. It was a long time ago. Um, it was in the nineties and, uh, the place I worked was really cool because everybody else there that was working there as security was, uh, giant. And some of those guys had gone there at that time to get on what was it's called the K one circuit. They were kickboxers. So I, um, you know, I'm no, uh, no shrimp or anything. Six, three, um, used to lift all that stuff before I got old fat but uh these guys were just monsters and um i was ended up filling a sort of comic relief role and you know the, the club was big i'm blanking on the name because i'm on the spot but at like two levels and um every, these guys were just hyped up and i wouldn't have to do anything i'd go man is that what is that guy that guy looks a little they go what and get over there and, and deal with it <laughs> so I was, uh, it was a pretty easy gig <laughs> and, uh, the same owner had another club in a district called Shibuya, which is another, uh, sort of Hepcat Tokyo district. And that one was smaller and, uh, fun. And, uh, you know, being, it was Tokyo and Japan, it wasn't like a roadhouse, you know, no one. <laughs> and in the nineties in, in Japan was just, uh, drowning in money. They have some sort yeah. of, I'm not an economist, economical, economics person, but uh, as is apparent, my inability <laughs> to pronounce it. Um, but they were just a wash in cash, you know, and um, so it was a, it was pretty fortuitous. I'd been there, I'd gotten over there in the in the navy, and then uh, you know, I was stationed on a ship out of uh, Yokosuka, Japan. And uh, after my enlistment was up, I just stayed for a couple of years just to sort of drink it in, you know, and came well, back. I, I've done, a, I've, I read a book on, actually it was a, a murder that took place in Rapungi. And okay. through that book, they talked a lot about the culture and how, oh yes, that was like the place for foreigners to go mm -hmm. and stay and get a job and make some extra money and yeah, yeah. Uh, you know and just plain have fun so mm -hmm. but we are here tonight to talk about your kickstarter your upcoming yeah. comics and thule's vision why don't we start with thule's vision absolutely um so i started writing in about 2014 i think yeah and um wrote a story, got it, it got published, picked up by this magazine called Lore Magazine. And uh, at that time, it was, a, it was a really productive time. I was writing a lot and uh, hooked up with a Crusover Magazine, which is great, it's fantastic, uh, Alex over there. And um, I just, I had, a, I just got a lot done and I, got, I wrote a lot and it was pretty, it was like the salad days. Like I, I, at that time I had a 45 minute commute and sometimes hours, sometimes an hour and a half um, on the bus. And I just sit on the bus with my headphones, listen to some doom metal or whatever, and uh, stare out the window and um, uh, with a little notebook. And I would just think and, and make notes and, and just space out. And then, uh, um, you know, sit down in the evenings and write for three or four hours. And uh, it was just fantastic. I was, I, I wasn't linking up with other writers or talking to people much, you know, um, just never been big on social media. So it was like very much 
sort of an isolation and it was just wonderful. And I wrote a bunch of stories that I, I just really were really, um, I love them and they're very important to me. And I uh, decided that uh, there was a Sophie Markets and, um, you know, Kirsova can't publish every single word I write. So I put them together and I uh, put them into this, uh, Thune's Vision, and um, put it on Amazon and had a great time with it. And, uh, you know, got nice emails and, and met people and it was just fantastic. And uh, then uh, later on, fast forward, uh, I'm hanging out with this this cat, Neil Durando, and he uh, is actually a refugee from New York publishing in the 90s, like uh, I used to work for Knopf. And um, he just up and decided to start his own imprint and focus on uh, genre fiction. And I I told him, I was like, why don't, why don't I just pull Thunes off of Amazon and let's, let's work on it. Let's polish it up. I'm going to put some new material in there and let's make it more of a, a book book. Um, the, the ability for someone to go and self publish on Amazon is wonderful. And uh, I'm, I'm certainly not uh, throwing shade on that. Um, but I thought, uh, you know, in, in the intervening years, like I could just do this material uh, just a little bit better. I could do this, not the writing, um, but the the production of, of this book. I could um, give it a better treatment. And, um, you know, I still have a lot of the paperbacks and books that I had as a kid. And I wanted something that I could just put, put next to that stuff. And so, uh, so let me ask yeah. then. Um, mm -hmm. You write sword and sorcery, from what I understand. Yeah, with some other other bits thrown in, but for, uh, it's sword and sorcery is uh, definitely definitely big. So, what would you uh, for new readers, someone who's not familiar with your work, how would you describe it? Um, someone reviewed my stuff once, and I haven't looked at reviews in a long time. I think it's a it's a bit of a trap. But uh, someone said I'd missed my audience by 70 years. That sounds like and a compliment. Yeah. That was a very, and they meant it as a compliment, um, or at least, you know. But uh, so that's sort of where I am. I, I grew up in a weird sort of time capsule. My dad was a friend of a, a gentleman named P. Schuyler Miller. That's who I'm named for. And P. Schuyler Miller was uh, one of the first bibliographers for Robert E. Howard. Like they corresponded. Ooh. If you get some of the old like uh, Lancer paperbacks, and I could have it switched up, I'd have to run upstairs and look. But uh, you know, some of the Howard collections, there'll be an in introduction by P. Schuyler Miller, and um, he wrote a couple things too. But he was, you know, just a uh, very active in that milieu. You know what I mean? At that time. And um, he was a really good friend of my dad's. Uh, they worked together in Pittsburgh in this place called Fisher Scientific. And um, my dad was a loved fantasy and science fiction. And I grew up in a house uh, just, uh, like with just thousands of paperbacks. Um, and uh, being in it's the the growing up in the seventies and eighties, you know, you've got Conan comics, you've got Frazetta art everywhere. You've got the Conan movie, the, the masterpiece. Milius, you know, and all this stuff is this, um, and even the toys, you know, and all this stuff, uh, you know, it's all swirling around in here. So when I finally sat down to write, um, on a whim, a friend of mine, you know, I, you always think, oh, someday I'll write a book, someday I'll write a novel. And a friend of mine said, let's, let's write some short fiction. Why don't you write some short fiction? And it just sort of like uh, unlocked it in me. Like, duh, like, of course, I, I don't have to sit around waiting for um, my magnum opus to land on me. I'm going to start writing short fiction. I'm going to experiment. I'm going to try to, to, to recreate the, uh, or generate these emotions that I experienced 
uh, when I used to read, you know, and the, the, that, that sort of the joy and the terror and, and the, um, the blood and, and everything else. And, uh, and so I, I, it was kind of in a weird time capsule. Do you know what I mean? Did yeah. You? So that's, that's where I was coming from. And so, um, you know, I don't, I don't want to sound egotistical or anything like that but uh doing something like that by chance um just in the sort of the way things are now you know comes off as pretty fresh to a lot of people and you know people would email and be like man that was awesome like you know um trying to connect trying to trying to hit those beats hard and and really move the needle and doing it with there's no winking at the audience there's no you know elbow and the ribs you know it's it's 100 percent genuine you know there's no like uh you know if someone reads it and you know certainly everyone's different and everyone likes different stuff someone encounters my work and they think it's a little corny you know that's it's not it's not for you, man. You know what I mean? Like, th th there's no inside joke here. You know, this is it. This is where we're going for it. You know what I mean? Um, and that's sort of where I was coming from. That's where Thunes came from. And, uh, you know, I've got let me get the table of contents here. You know, the Challengers Garland is like a um, like sort of a, a, a take on Death Dealer. Uh, Athon and the Priestess is this, like, uh, you know, again, you know, I'm sitting here blowing a horn on my own horn, but, like, uh, someone told me it was, like, uh, it's this massive epic story, but it's it's not very long at all, and compare that to all the stuff in, you know, on the shelf where it's, like, 600 pages and nothing really yeah. happens, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, the Movements of the Ege was a, a really fun story to write. That's uh, a first contact story, but it's told from the perspective of the aliens. And, you know, you hear about the, well, like the Klingons or, or other things like that. You hear about like the warrior race, the, the sort of the trope of the warrior alien race. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to write a story to try to like, you know, you watch the Klingons and you're like, well, who takes out the trash, man? Like, who? <laughs> like, are they like Spartans? Do they have slaves do all the unfun stuff? You know, I don't I don't know. They might. I'm, I'm sure some Star Trek fan has figured all this out, though. You know, actually, that, that was always a huge hole in the uh, Klingons was mm -hmm. it's, okay, it's so where they're where they're scientists, where are their uh, shipbuilders. Yeah. yeah. Who designs their fashions. You know what I mean? Like, you know. We know they have um, cooks because we've seen them. Yeah. We have yes. seen a scientist, and he even talks about how uh, he's on the bottom rung of their society. Oh, okay. So uh, it, yeah. it did come up. So. It did come up. It, yeah, it had to. So, like, in this story, um, this is the, the alien warrior race. So it, their biological cycle actually depends on them slaughtering one another. You know, on the battlefield where they're all lying dead, uh, the females come and um, implant eggs in their corpses. Oh, then, that's neat. That I yeah. like. So, and this all happens on a very rigid schedule for them based on the, the movements of uh, their moons. So a, uh, uh, a ship of human explorers crashes and interrupts their cycle. And they, they talk about their battles, um, and their battles are elaborate dances. It's, it's like this sort of dance motif. But they, they these aliens are very, very proud, and they're very, very vain. And they're very, very, like the, the, the protagonist of the story is, is the leader of his group because he's the tallest and most beautiful and, and most capable of violence. And um, so this ship interrupts their ritual. And, you know, one of the war parties is like, this is so depressing. We're just going to go home and, and we'll see you the next moon. And but he chooses to investigate because he's so infuriated. And even him investigating is. Um, is out of character for his species and his his people, 
and you know it's um you know so but that's because they're a warrior this is all they do you know this is this is their i just wanted to write a actual warrior race you know so that was a lot of fun to read or to write and the ecology of the unicorn is a uh sort of vancian style story where uh this wizard who feels the his death is approaching he's put it off for centuries but and he knows that the fae are um if not immortal near immortal so he has a fae prisoner so he's trying to extract the secret of immortality from him and uh the fae hints that it's due to the presence of unicorns in in the fae realm so he travels there and there's a bit of nastiness that happens you know because he's a wizard you know wizards are generally bad and uh the last story is the saga of Adelwolf, wolf which is um a story about a group of uh like it, it's never explicitly said because it doesn't have to be but anyone reading it would, would gather that these are uh germanic tribesmen um probably in around the time of the marcomanni wars um in rome uh, i mean in, in the the roman empire and um this particular warrior the hero other wolf is cheated for it uh he's denied his opportunity for revenge so on the road uh a man with a gray cloak and eye patch appears and grants him a spear and of course um it's not explicitly said because it doesn't have to be what we all know. This is Wotan granting this warrior his spear, which has happened in a couple sagas and myths and whatnot. And the spear makes you just obviously a tank in battle and enable, you know, enables you to slaughter people at will. But being that it's a Germanic myth, um, it's not a happy story. And um, we know that Wotan may appear at any moment and just take it back usually right before a battle. So uh, what I really wanted to do with that is um, I really wanted to get at um, the brutality of that period in history and sort of the reality of um, pagan life where nothing mattered but strength. You know, there was no nothing mattered but strength. You know, if you wanted the God's attention, if you wanted the God's help, um, they either gave it to you on some whim as when he got the spear or because your sacrifices brought them attention, you know? So, um, you know, there was just endless fighting, endless slaughter, and it was all, and it was just a, an environment where the only thing that mattered was strength and victory. And, um, and, you know, when fickle fate steps in, uh, things get bad. But that was a, a blast to write. That was an absolute blast. But yeah, sounds and now, like uh, sounds like some good stuff, honestly. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll de yeah, I meant to before. I'm just totally crushed right now, but I'll definitely uh, forward you guys some the review copy. Oh, thank you. Yeah, no huge problem. thank oh, you. I've done it before. Yeah. Well, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, do you find that you prefer writing short stories to long fiction? Yeah, you know, what's funny is, like, because I started, like, um, just by luck, you know, I started very unencumbered. And I started and I would just write, I, you know, I would just write the story in the way that it needed to be written without any respect to length or anything. And of course, you know, as I'm thinking about them and conceiving them, naturally they're they're shorter pieces because I'm sort of just rattling around in my head, you know, uh, in a sitting without taking uh, tons of notes or anything. And oddly enough, I found that like I, I really do like writing short pieces, um, and then but the more complicated stories that came out, um, and I'm still working on, you know, st still like this, but like. I really seem to like the novella length. Like, uh, like I could do a lot of 
uh, I can plant some seeds in the beginning and, and they can sort of uh, bloom very naturally. And, uh, you know, you can have uh, enough time for enough things to happen and enough characters to sort of get, get um, their due and everything. I did finally um, start a story and it's progressed to a point where I realized this will be a novel. Uh, just because of the things I've set up, uh, it's going to take a novel to resolve them all. So that was cool. I, I, I wish I could be more deliberate in a lot of these things. And I, I suppose if I, the longer I go, the more likely, you know, the more, more of that skill I'll, I'll gain. But it, at this point, it, I just, um, I just like to just see where it goes and see what happens. And, um, you know, if it ends up being 8,000 words, that's great. If it ends up being 21,000 words, that's great, you know. And um, that's that's sort of what's worked for me, definitely. I am pretty curious to see how this uh, the novel turns out. I did once as an experiment, like, say, okay, I made all these notes. I made an outline, and I wrote maybe, God, it must have been 30,000. No, I don't know how much, 30,000, 10,000, 20,000. Of a, of a proper novel and you know at a certain point i'm like this is freaking lifeless man this is <laughs> you know what i mean there is no spark in this thing and i just i ran away from i'll it. be yeah. honest i i prefer novella length to novel length and no, i always i, I always yeah. appreciated the way that the pulps didn't need to cram in filler no, they got shit done yeah. yeah that all changed somehow in the 80s there's um it was it was uh Stephen King maybe and then I think for fantasy maybe um Robert Jordan Robert Jordan the, the sort of Shannara guy and like, yeah, I think everyone's know, regretting uh letting uh Martin promise winter and just sticking with it yeah yeah <laughs> what a fiasco he said it may never come nope no, really. That's he, what everyone's he's, he's finally yeah. said that. Yeah, he said winter might not come. He's busy with the other things. Oh, oh God. God. You know, whatever, man. He got paid. You know what I mean? Like he won. Yeah. You know, I, I just like uh, it. I don't know. Maybe if you handed me eleven a kajillion dollars, it would it would change my mind overnight. But like it would just seem like like I you know you, when someone gives you your eyeballs. You, you owe them. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, oh, yeah. you know, if it's not their cup of tea, that's fine. You know what I mean? I mean, I don't know. I can't tell you how many books I put down, you know, but, but like, if someone, if someone, and you know, there are people that were buying statuettes and, and, you know, like, what if you had a garage full of Game of Thrones crap? You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, it was like, you know, I fuck it, guys, I'm fine, you know. I, I don't know, man. That's just messed up. I, I mean, and God knows, like, you know, um, I try to stay positive, man. You know, I, I'm not here to to rag on anybody necessarily. It's tempting as it might be. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I don't know him. I don't know. I'm not living his life. I don't know what's going on. Um, when I see that, the example, the, what I want to take from it is like, I, I don't want to hose people, man. <laughs> you know? You know, I don't, I don't, and, you know, there are so many ways to waste your time in this giant existential crisis we call a civilization. Like if, if anyone reads one of my stories, you know, I want them to feel like, you know, they got their, their money's worth. And that, that relationship between the, the writer and the reader, you know, I, I, you know, you just don't want to break it or, or abuse it you know what i mean oh yeah and and of course you know that's he's playing on a whole nother level as far as the the pressure and everything so who knows man well who knows? adjusting the subject matter a little bit i understand that you have also uh dipped your toe into comics yeah um and that's that's so cool because you guys are doing the arkham stuff it's like really um, so, uh, a guy just, just contacted me and he's like, you know, I like your stuff. Do you want to work on a comic? And I said, yes. Um, 
and his name is Ryan Dirks. He's an artist. Uh, uh, he's living in the Midwest now. A uh, really cool, interesting guy. And he, uh, we, we just, we talked a bit and we're like, okay, we're on the same level. We're, we're thinking about the same things. We want the same things out of a comic. And then, okay, let's cook something up. And uh, I'm not sure. So, you know, we got all these things in the mix and like, sort of the fantasy it you know as a writer I, i'm you know came to this place where what if we're gonna do our own he-man we're just gonna make we're gonna make something sort of like he-man it's not he-man it's inspired by he-man but like we're gonna make this we're gonna make this crazy ass science fantasy story we're gonna create this world we're gonna populate it with characters and, and we're gonna have all sorts of crazy stuff happen. And um, we're gonna do a comic and it'll be like the comics when we were kids. And that if you pick up an issue, you, you're pretty much guaranteed a good time. You know, uh, it doesn't mean it's stupid. It doesn't mean it, it's dumbed down, but uh, there's, you know, before I walked away from a lot of the modern stuff, you know, you're sitting there reading an issue and it's like, why do I have to flip back to find out what's going on? Like what, you know, um, that sort of uh, graphic storytelling in, in the way that I'm thinking of and the way that I'm talking about has uh, really dropped off, sort of fallen by the wayside. You know, we want to make a really kick-ass comic. It's going to make you feel good and feel feel that this is cool and have a great time and explore all this weird wild stuff you know and um it's uh the project is called the lords of metheria and he's just finished the inks on issue one and he's finishing up the inks on a short that will appear in a sword and sorcery zine um put out by uh this gentleman named jason tarpey who is of the band uh, Eternal Champion, uh, an amazing, like uh, old school metal band, you know. And this guy's like totally, totally uh, on the level and really just going for it too. Another, just the same thing with, with my writing. And you know, we've emailed a lot, and he's just an ace guy. Where it's like. You know, if you look at a Frazetta painting and, and you sort of smirk or snicker, then like there's the door pal. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, like just just go do something else, man. Go go binge some garbage show and, and leave me alone. <laughs> you know, like um, it, it's heroic. It's unabashedly heroic, unashamedly heroic. And there's there's good guys and bad guys. And. You know, one guy has an axe and, and another guy has a laser and, and like crazy crap is happening, you know, and uh, I'm really psyched about it. Um, we have not figured out how we want to publish it. And we're going to cross that bridge after we get uh, some stuff done and really sort of examine how to how to go about that. Probably try to email John Delaro. Tell me your secrets, man. <laughs> well, I know f for us, so uh, we found it was for us, we found that it was best to collect the whole thing into one graphic novel right. and do yeah. a Kickstarter for that. Um, although there are people like uh, like John who um, I believe have put them out in issues. Yeah. Um, but they've uh, so it works for different people in different ways. It also yeah. depends on the audience that you're going for. Mm -hmm. um, is this a black and white or a color book? Oh, we're going to do it in color. Oh, nice. I think the short will be in black and white, but we plan on doing the main issue in color. There's a lot of like cool little decisions to make. Like, are we going to, are we going to try to replicate sort of the four color look or are we going to go more modern? Don't know yet. He's got a really cool style. Um, it's, uh, I don't know what I call it. I grappled with this on an interview recently too, but I like it. So it's obviously a little bit old school, but not that I, I mean, the cool thing about comics is, is that you can just do anything. 
you know, you can mm -hmm. get away with that. as long as it works, you know, as long as is as long as it works, you know what I mean? No, definitely. Yeah. And uh, well, like, um, you know, since, uh, you know, this is again, more sword and sorcery, I'm thinking of the um, first ad adaption of uh, Moorcock's Elric um, in graphic uh, novel form. And yeah. it, it wasn't quite four color, but uh, it definitely was done in that style, but also with like Art Nouveau artwork. And yeah. um, the artwork is just absolutely gorgeous and holds up today. So you can definitely do something beautiful with the uh, old school, like more mm -hmm. color look. Yeah, definitely. It's so funny. Even though, so how long ago was that public? And it was just totally kick ass. You know, it's not like everyone's acting like they got to reinvent the wheel. But there's just so no. much stuff. So much stuff in the in the archive. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, so do you know then when uh, people might be able to either support the first story, or um, are you still working that out uh, when, with your artist? Yeah, when that zine is is out, I'll certainly uh, post it on my website. Uh, the however that thing gets sold. Um, as far as the, the comic proper, when that gets underway, I, I would expect that we'll have it all figured out by summer or fall, fall at the latest, because uh, he is fired up. I'm fired up. I've plotted six issues of this thing. Nice. Um, and like, I love to draw. Um, I was going to ask you about that, actually. Yeah, I love to draw. I don't like I'm not at a point where. Or I could, but like, um, I mean, Ryan's a proper artist. Ryan, yeah, my rat. Um, Ryan's a proper <laughs> artist. Uh, so like, you know, if I'm going to sit down and do a comic, I've got to like figure it all out. You know what I mean? Like uh, doodles and, and, and pinup style sort of, you know, your hero or whatever. That's all well and good. But, um, you know, when you're doing a comic comic, it, it's a lot lot more uh, choices and things like that um i would like to do my own comic one of these days i've got like this long yeah if you like the the chewbacca looking guy down there um <laughs> that's from my secret not really secret comic project that might never get done called starweed <laughs> yeah and that's the character of he's chunandez and his faithful, assistant, um, his faithful assistant, BMBX. Um, nice. And Chunandez is an imperial weed inspector. And, uh, you know, because uh, I can't damage Star Wars any more than it's already been damaged by the people that own it. So <laughs> this thing is just like, it's completely uncorked. Like, uh, in this in this uh, take, um, the empires are actually the good guys, and the rebellion are uh, people absolutely incensed that their um, liberal arts degrees aren't worth anything in this new meritocracy. <laughs> so, um, Junandez is an imperial weed inspector, and uh, he uncovers a conspiracy to sell um, where the rebellion is trying to use weed that's been poisoned to make people zombies so that they'll uh, <laughs> go, just fall in the line. Yeah. I so. think this should be published. Yeah, it should. <laughs> it might be my best idea ever. <laughs> but um, uh, that's going to take a bit, you know. But uh, oh. yeah, I got some like Macquarie type sketches there. Yeah, I dig those. Those are nice. They're thank nice. You, Very thank nice. You. All right. So tell us about okay. the rat. Oh, you got a question. Oh, no. Well, no, go ahead. Uh, tell us about the rat. And then we have um, a couple of comments from the chat. Oh, awesome. Uh, the rat. Um, being that I grew up in the 80s and um, my mom, um, extremely kind to my brother and I, and would take us to see movies all the time. Saw so many movies. And I remember seeing Secret of Nim, which was uh, terrifying, absolutely terrifying. I think it's why Gen Xers are so bulletproof. You know, we just saw all these scary ass movies. Uh, but, yeah. um, Agreed. So I have a lifelong uh, interest in intelligent anthropomorphic rats. I actually wrote a game, um, a 
RPG uh, game where uh, humanity's gone and uh, there has some, been some sort of cataclysmic event and rats have uh, leveled up evolutionarily speaking. And so these rats in this place called Manor Hill have uh, adopted, they've, they've started to uh, grapple with technology and things like that. And there's still rats though, you know, they live in warrens and things like that. And um, uh, it, yeah, it was a lot of fun. And these rats, uh, uh, they name themselves after things that they see and read. So you can name your character Mountain Dew or Best Pizza. <laughs> you know what I mean? And uh, on one side of the manor, there's a, a, a statue of Mary around which this cult of, of sort of uh, vegetarianism and peace and, and love has grown up. And on the other side of the manor, there's this garage where they've rigged up with huge speakers and these guys in red lights, blinking red lights, and, and they blast metal all night. And at, at the culmination <laughs> of at the culmination of every evening, they, they end up cannibalizing one of their own. So your rat character can be torn between two different, you know, if your rat needs healing, they might go to the, the Mary uh, cult. But uh, if they fail a save, they'll be absorbed into the vegetarian collective. And if they visit the metal guys to get uh, tools or parts and they fail to save, they'll be uh, absorbed into the cannibal metal cult, you know. And, uh, you know, the, the Mary cult's mostly female and the, the metal cult's mostly male. And uh, if anything, that was to make a joke about how uh, even with rats, there's just not a lot of chicks at the metal show. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, you know, rats and rats do tend to self -seg segregate in that way. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, so, do you have a rat now? No, I don't. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I hold them up. You would think I have one. Um, uh, you know, marriage is a partnership, and there's a lot of compromise and, and communication. And uh, um, the household is not 100% behind the ownership of a uh, pet rat. And I decided uh, that it's not a hill I need to die on. Also, they only live like a couple years, man. It seems sad. Just when you and your rat are really getting to know each other, he's going to croak, man. I've come to accept that. Yeah. Yeah, Do you we, guys we, have we pet keep, rats? We keep rats, yeah. Oh, We've my been... God. You guys got we pet keep... rats. We had to ask, but we, we saw that. Was... It's serendipitous. <laughs> But well, yeah, it, it is tough when uh, um, they only live for so long. Yeah, so. but, but I mean, I've I've found a way to kind of reconcile that, and it's it. Uh, I read you know, that, that older male rats will tend to become chill and, and even snuggly in cases. Mm -hmm. Is that we only point? we only get males? Yeah, only get males. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, I need to have a harem of males in my house. <laughs> <laughs> and and they're definitely little shits. Uh, they will pro play pranks on you. And But yes, when awesome. they get older, they are adorable. So. <laughs> but, awesome. uh, no, no. Just, just to indicate just how much we, we like rats, I've actually written a sci-fi novel. I saw that. Yeah, I'm looking forward to reading that. Oh, oh thank you. I was like, oh, man. This guy's scratching my itch right here. <laughs> should be way to some sort of clearinghouse for rat stories so I don't have yeah. to find them by accident oh but, that's a good there's an anthology yeah that's Is a great one? idea huh yeah. well we'll have to we'll have to have a meeting yeah. on that anthology yeah. about yeah. intelligent rats or yes. hyper intelligent rats mm -hmm. right, or just so rats in general in that rats game in world about the the Young Mountain Dew trying to find his way in the new rat world. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, should we get to the questions? Yes. Okay. okay. So the first one is from uh, Dungeon Delver, and he asks, are you a fan of Fritz Lieber? Yes, very much. Um, I've got a couple editions of those. And um, I have these two characters, uh, Mortu and Kyrus. Mortu's a, a giant barbarian from the north. And Kairos is a Christian monk who's, uh, by way of evil sorcery, has been trapped in the body of a small monkey. 
And um, so these these two companions uh, travel together and uh, adventure together, and it's very much uh, in the mold of uh, Fawford and the Grey Mouser. Yeah, Fritz Lieber is one of the um, the uh, sort of columns on which everything rests. If you scroll up a little bit, um, see that orange sticker? That's my beautiful dog. Um, scroll no. down a little bit. A little, oh, down a little? Okay. Yeah. This um, one. Nice. Yeah. Um, that is more to in, in uh, Kairos. Kairos is the monkey on top of the guy's head. And they oh, try I see. To cross the wasteland on uh, his iron steed. Oh, that sounds great. Nice. Yeah, it's a, it's been a, a a great, you know, one of the goals was to create uh, some characters that I could come back to in, in episodic and in, in adventures and all that. And uh, more to Kairos has been a lot of fun because I can, you know, Kairos is naturally um, a giant smart ass. And he's, he has quotes like, uh, you know, he was a, he was a Christian monk, but he says, uh, if it w uh, except for the requirement of humility, I was the greatest of my order, you know, things like that. And, uh, you know, he chides in the newest story that's coming out in the new Thune's vision. He chides more to for being dour and quiet. And uh, more to says, well, why is a monk? complaining about me being quiet. Shouldn't you be quiet? And he says, well, in fact, it was a point of contention among me and my colleagues. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you know, he just can't keep his mouth shut. But yeah, those those guys are a lot of fun to write. Cool. Um, Bar One says, it was fun meeting you at Pulp Fest. Oh, I just yeah. need to do that at a bigger convention. Yeah, for sure. That was, that was uh, the first convention I was at a comic book convention when I was like uh, 13 or 14. I went to one in Roville. And that's when back when comic conventions were just just a big room full of comics. Um, but I, uh, those days. Uh, I got to go to Pulp Fest in Pittsburgh. And um, I was uh, DMR Books. Dave from DMR Books went and uh, asked me, you know, you're in Pittsburgh. You want to come by? So, yeah. So I got to sit at the table and, and you know sign books and have a good time. That was fantastic. Yeah, and I met uh, uh, Bar One, and I think in, the, in our weird Kevin Bacon scene connection here, um, he's done work for Kirsova, I think. But yeah, that was, that was a lot of fun, meeting him in his cool little booth. And I got to see him work in like, uh, um, I only really started getting serious about drawing maybe two or three years ago. You know, I always doodle, you know what I mean? But like, you know, trying to actually improve. So it was real neat seeing him work. And of course, he's really, really good. Nice. What pen are you using, man? What pen are you using, man? Tell me what pen you're using. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's always the thing. What are you using? What are your tools? Yeah. That's, I don't care. I want to know. <laughs> I look like a noob. School this noob. Oh. The uh, the the uh, is it uh, oh, it's not thick, it's uh, oh, the, the tech nines, those are really really good. Um, but they come from Japan and so they're expensive. Um, uh, so I had I had it's been years since I bought mine. Um, Art Anon Studios yeah. says sky, sky is an amalgam of REH plus Vance with a dash of A Merit plus some Roy G crinkle on the side on the That's art very, side. Very flattering. Yeah, I have to. I have to live another two hundred years to be Roy. <laughs> but um, oh, I know that guy too. Ardenon's great. He did uh, he did all these uh, wild ass mecha drawings um, for a guy named Brad for C. Walker, which did this. He kind of did this cool Voltroni kind of thing right up my alley. No, oh, cool. I uh, I do. Uh, I don't mean to be too too on on the nose here but i do prefer conan to solomon kane i do like solomon kane um uh but i i do like conan better uh i have to like solomon kane has some pretty badass comics too i got that collection i've been barely in it and i have that nice uh 
Song of McCain edition, the paperback that has the cool photo covers when you get all those. I gotta look that up. But definitely Conan. Um, um, Milius is Conan. Um, I think is very faithful in spirit to Robert E. Howard, but obviously he he just sort of <clears throat> what's a, a brand new story. It's not really um, a canonical Conan story, but mm -hmm. it's just etched in my brain. You know, reading all those. Reading those Conan paperbacks, the Frazetta covers, that Milius film, and then like Roy Thomas and John Buscema, like I, you know, like if I was going to be stationed at the Arctic and they told me to bring just one box of things, it'd probably be like a couple of Vans paperbacks, and then like you know as many uh, old Conan comics as I could stuff in the box. And that. Uh... The soundtrack to Milius's film is one of the best ever written. Mm -hmm. It's like they, you know, there's like no other movie like that. You no, know? there's just not another like, oh, you're in a mood for something else. And the Code of the Destroyer, you like, I liked it when I was a kid, but it's it's not in even any way, shape, or form the same kind of movie. No, that Conan the Barbarian was. Um, I'm almost afraid to watch it. You know, like. I won't watch it again. Yeah, cause I, I mean, I liked it when I was a kid. You know what I mean? But uh, that Milius Conan movie, my God. Okay, um, Samuel I also asks or says uh, the Eye of Sunu by by Skyler looks great. I will start there probably. I have really started to appreciate short stories in the last few years. It's an endorsement. Yeah. Eye of Sunu is awesome. This, Eye of Sunu is a. Uh, Pretty beefy, and like I look at, it, I'm like Jesus, I wrote all this shit. Like, wow, <laughs> when did I have the time? Um, the Eye of Sonu is uh oh, I, you know what? I brewed mead once uh, <laughs> I've been for years. I, I brewed it once, and uh, um, I think it I did set uh, I aged it for about two weeks, and I tried. Or, uh, no, wait, it was like maybe a week and i i poured some out and i had it and it was uh it was fantastic but it, it didn't have a lot of kick to it so you know i put it back in the basement and then two or three weeks later it was just vile like i don't know what i did but i gotta i gotta go back to the drawing room on that i was using an extremely simple recipe just using bread yeast and um i think if you do that you know, with the tools that I have and, and the process that I was using, you know, like you just let it let it ferment for a couple of days and you have this like bubbly, refreshing, um, very low key mead. But to do it um, properly, I'm going to have to hit the books and uh, and and really figure it out. And just make bathtub wine like all the old guys in the old neighborhood. Uh, Dungeon Delver asks, as busy as you are, um, do you feel, did you fit in time for tabletop gaming? And if so, how much of uh, 1E AD&D do you play and how often? Um, I wish I had more time for tabletop gaming. Um, I think we all do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. During the lockdown, um, I got obsessed with the idea of playing first edition AD&D because I just don't really care for the modern interpretations. And I really wanted to know, I wanted to know what it was all about. I had those books as a kid. And of course, um, you know, a 12 or 13 year old, unless he's a lot smarter than me, doesn't have much of a shot against those. And um, I ran a couple games and then my buddy, Jeffro Johnson, uh, he was in those games and 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 he did it just a very Jeffro Johnson kind of thing where he's like well well you know I sort of broke the ice or whatever and he went and he ran with it and he ran this insane insane campaign that's reached all this domain level stuff um it, as soon as I get a chance I'll drop back into that um another friend of mine and probably more than that now guys are alternating running it um I think that uh, if I could only play one more game for the rest of my life, I'd probably play 1E because I feel like I I, I don't feel like I've gotten um, everything I can get out of it. 
Um, it's it's just uh, there's a lot going on, and it's a lot more of different mindsets than uh, um, you know the, the ones that I encountered later as an adult playing third, fourth, and fifth edition. Um, and you know you know anyone can play anything they want. There's no rules, you know, and um, different people are going to like different things about different games. <clears throat> but uh, if you look at Gygax and the things he was he was plugged into and the way they used to play back then, man, I think it's pretty, pretty awesome. And uh, Jeffro's work to sort of uncover that uh, is uh, pretty cool. And I'm pretty stoked to be have the chance to play it again. Yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, kids playing D and D now with the new stuff have no idea what they're missing. No. Yeah, it, it's really like, and I used to DM a lot. Um, and I look back on it now, and it was like, you know, it, like I want to play a game. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want to do this sort of improv theater. <laughs> And maybe somebody does want to do improv theater. You know what I mean? Like some people want to dress up like goblins and throw beanbags at each other. Like it's America. You do whatever you want, man. You know, I'm not here to harsh on it. But um, like as a DM, you know, I'm like at this table and I've taken on this responsibility of making sure everybody has a good time. And like when I look at, look at 1E and the way they used to play and like, they, they weren't doing that. They were they were playing a game. You know what I mean? They weren't having this experience that the DM is responsible for delivering. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and like, you know, when it got to play in, in Jeffro's game, it was like, oh, all right, we're playing a game. You know, this is awesome. You know, so that's kind of where I'm at with that. All right. Well, we're coming up to the end of the show, so mm -hmm. why don't you uh, do some last-minute promoting about where we can find your books? Um, right. One more last pitch about why everyone should be supporting your Kickstarter, and we'll go from there. Mm -hmm. All right. So we'll work up to the Kickstarter. So first thing you got to do is go check out DMR Books. Uh, he's, he's a freaking great guy, and he's got a big catalog of all sorts of righteous stuff. And among that is this, which is uh, uh, a ton of stories that I had published in Kursova. And then one fresh, new, only can get it here story uh, called The Tragedy of Thern about these uh, this horrible villain that wants to undo everything uh, and how these wizards conspire to stop him. Um, so definitely check out the Omar books. Uh, Pile and Press. Um, Oh, and the first Mortu and Kyra story is in here. So the first Mortu and Kyra story is in here. The second Mortu and Kyra is in this collection called The Penultimate Men uh, from Pile and Press. And uh, it's got some wild stuff in it. Uh, it's really cool. Really, really cool. It's got a little bit of writing, uh, a little bit of nonfic from uh, Jeffro. And um, uh, John Mollison who's a fantastic dude and a fantastic writer. And uh, it's got the second Mortun Kairos story called The Judgment of Daganha, where Mortun Kairos run afoul of this scorpion cult, which is just power alley stuff. And then, um, or perhaps first, go to the Kickstarter and uh, line yourself up to get the second edition of this book, which is um, stuff that... Uh, I just love, I just love these stories. And uh, obviously I hope you will too, because they're written from a, a very, um, very genuine place. And uh, there's an incredible amount of uh, just affection and care with these things. Uh, it's got a variety of stories in here. We've got some sword and sorcery, uh, a more or less quasi historical fiction with the Germanic tribes and some uh, bizarre science fiction. And um, the expanded edition, the second edition, will have the third Mortu and Kyra story, where they, uh, it's called The Servants of the War God, where they run into these people uh, that um, uh, right in the middle of the road they're traveling on opens up into this massive chasm. 
and they discover a whole civilization of people living in the side of the cliff and swooping about the chasm on flying ships and fighting these flying beasts. And in the jungle below, uh, more two happens upon uh, a pretty deep, dark secret. And um, it's really cool because that's the third Mortu and Kyra story. And I've set up a pretty, pretty bizarre world that they're occupying. It's our world pretty far in the future. And with two other novellas uh, on the shelf and getting to the third novella, um, it's, it's a very natural, organic time to start talking about some of the details and backstory of this world. And uh, it's, it's pretty, <laughs> wild, pretty wild stuff. So definitely uh, check out check out the Kickstarter, and um, and uh, you know I got a website, and when the comic is underway, and when I got more stuff coming out, uh, I'll be putting it on there. And if you want to see some stupid doodles and some uh, cute baby pictures, you know, come find me on Instagram, Fortress Models. And links are in the description. And we got one last question. Samuel, I asked, what's your favorite Robert E. Howard uh, tale? Uh, specifically horror tale. Horror tale? Oh. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I have to go get the book. I'm gonna okay, get favorite metal band. That. <laughs> Probably, um, I, I don't know if it considered a horror but uh worms well that's a horror i'm gonna say worms of the earth that's one of my all-time favorite howard stories period that's a horror story you know like uh brand mac uh i think of him as another sword sorcerer character but that is, that's a proper horror story it's the worms of the earth which is fantastic if you haven't read a good read all right. Very well, cool. again, everyone, I suggest you uh, check out his Kickstarter, support it. If mm -hmm. you are definitely into uh, sword and sorcery, pulp sci-fi, and uh, stuff that is not woke. And just all around badass stories. And uh, thank you for okay. joining us, man. Yes, thank, thank you so thanks much. Thanks for having me. It was a great time. I'm going to come back next time, and I'll just be all sizzling hot takes. <laughs> I, absolutely. All, why not? All hot takes. Just, oh, just burn up the internet. It, definitely when you know when your comic is coming out or if you have anything else to promote um you know hit us up we're happy to br bring you back on well i mean we did do an entire episode on you know look philip k dick was never a communist true <laughs> wake the hell up <laughs> that was awesome yeah <laughs> oh cool you check that out yeah yeah you check that out yeah. all right Wonderful. well the um, thumbnail with the yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everyone. Thank you All for right. joining us. Have a great night.